Good afternoon. Thank you, Prof. Chua. Um, it's glad to be here. Yeah, let me just um, move on to share my screen. Just give me a second. Yeah. Um, so I am Veronica. It's great to be here. And uh, we are, you know, age group or early, as we call ourselves right now, is a preventive care startup. Our focus is really sort of interesting. Um, I think we look at um, how we can redesign healthcare so that we can move from the traditional sort of sick care to healthcare. In today's talk, I think it'll be interesting to kind of, you know, along with SUTD and friends from Zhejiang, to look at from a sort of behavioral changing model and how we adopt technologies and also looking at sort of design thinking principles um, to kind of tackle these issues. Um, Singapore is a rich nation, as we know. Um, we are wealthier, we eat better, we have more money, and sometimes we can get a little bit lazier. Like many other nations, developed nations, uh, chronic diseases are um, prevalent. In Singapore, we rank number two uh, among developed nations in the, um, the number of diabetes um, patients per capita. And if we look across um, sort of the causes for mortality and death, and most of them are caused by cancers and what we call lifestyle chronic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular conditions, kidney, or liver conditions. And every day, um, 19 people die um, due to cardiovascular conditions. Now, you, you might recall for many of us in Singapore, 2016, uh, the Singapore government declared the war on diabetes. And through that, a, a series of policies, efforts, um, and resources put into place. And what um, the outcome was really, you know, was very encouraging that most of the Singaporeans right now are aware um, and able to identify what are the symptoms of diabetes. Since about March this year, Singapore governments also announced a healthier SG initiative. And this time moving even closer to look beyond just diabetes, but towards preventive care. We're looking at every Singaporean should have a primary physician, a concept relatively new here, but not new in other countries, especially in Europe. Now, um, also earlier this year, um, age group along with NUS, we did a pretty large scale hackathon and study. And through that, we are, um, we also learned that people are aware of the benefits versus the cost in taking better care of themselves in preventive measures. But the question is today, um, why is it that people are not doing it. Why, why is that people are not taking preventive healthcare measures? Um, the easiest way to say is that because we're human, our experiences in the past, what we heard from our friends and what we read in the news form our perceptions. And to summarize this, you know, we learned that um, there's sort of kind of maybe four categories we can say that why we're not doing the right thing to improve our health, why we are not you know, taking preventive care um, measures. Because I don't have time. Um, I know it's going to be a long wait. I don't know when I'm going to get out. Uh, I'm worried. I really don't want to know all the other hidden causes. They're going to charge you more. Um, they're going to put me on some procedures I didn't like. And uh, there's some group of people that we learn is I'm invincible. So it's, it, you know, even though today in Singapore, one in three um, will, will develop diabetes, but it's really easy for us to believe that it's not going to be me, right? I'm too young. Um, you know, if, if I go for it and spend all this money and the results are negative, it will be a waste of time and money. And lastly, um, there's also a group of folks that say that it's to kind of resign to the fact that, yes, my mother has diabetes. I'm definitely going to get diabetes. My, my 
grandfather had cancer, my dad had cancer, I'm gonna get cancer anyway, I'm gonna just buy some insurance to cover that. So that sort of you know, resides to the fact that it, um, mentality also exists in our society. Yeah, so it, it was quite interesting to see kind of, I think from, 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 from some years of experience of me dealing with like chronic disease um, patients um, doing chronic disease um, startups that we often, you know, in a startup community looking at um, a fairly sort of straightforward behavioral model, um, the, the social scientist called BJ Fogg. It, uh, you have, uh, VJ has a very sort of simple model and look at, you know, how people are making behavior change because making behavior change really has some, in, in, in his model has three components, right? One is motivation. Motivation meaning that what is sort of the, the factors that uh, be that with social factor, physical factor, money factors, economic factors that you have that can help you to make the changes. So we need to first understand that what is the motivation behind an individual. Now prompts, prompts are interesting. Prompts are triggers. Prompts are things that will kick off and helps you to make some changes. So this, uh, we need reminders. You can think of that as kind of a reminder, um, how we design reminders. And lastly is the ability. Do I, is, how do we make it easy that you know, instead of asking you to lose uh, 40 kilos of weight, how about you make 5,000 steps a day to begin with? So it's kind of helping people to kind of form that sort of, you know, simple to, under, um, to achieve ability um, to drive behavior changes. Now this sort of forms a loop, right? When you are able to achieve something, reinforces your motivation Right, so they kind of repeat that sort of into this, how behavior change um, is formed. Um, I'd like to look at, um, in my past life, looking at diabetes, uh, a very famous study, the 20 year, 21 year clinical study um, started in the United States. And the premise was quite simple. So a, a group of people are put into a program and last sort of six to 12 months. And just maybe just remember the time that was sort of pre-internet or sort of early internet time. People actually meet in person in sort of workshops. Um, the, the, the goal of diabetes prevention program was quite simple. We want, um, they wanted the participants to lose 7% of their body weight and do 150 minutes of exercise per week. That seems quite achievable. On it. Every day you would do some exercise. And as long as you do 150 minutes of exercise over a period of a week, um, that's okay. That's, that's kind of your goal. That forms a really small ability for you to, um, you will have the ability to achieve that. And look at that. And there's a series of different programs. They turn it into weekly programs, bite-side pieces. They don't talk about everything. They don't have to pick on one topic, for example, nutrition. Um, to begin with, uh, the type of food that you like to eat, uh, the social support that you can have. So that, that, that weekly programs uh, is bite-sized and very achievable. And then one of the important people, I think one of the things interesting that they think that they do in the DPP program is that every participant in the beginning of the workshop, they would um, step on a weighing scale, weigh themselves. Um, that prompts them. So I think gives them also some motivation that uh, you are also held accountable. Uh, there's a life coach that assigns to you, you answer a question that motivates you. And, 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 and what is astounding about this program is that at the end of a program, uh, the participants um, that participate in a DPP program, we're able to reduce the risk of developing diabetes by 58% as compared to um, just taking medication, metformin, um, the very common medication of diabetes alone. So, so, so since then, that DPP um, has been 
uh, sort of adopted to many different formats you know, by firstly many different countries. Secondly, in the last sort of 10 years, you will see has been adopted into a digital format and form a lot of different startups, including like Livongo um, and many other um, sort of chronic disease, weight loss um, startups. And that sort of form the same basis of program, like you have a motivation, ability and prompts and you repeat it and drive behavior change. Um, <laughs> Necessarily. So we also understand that um, in, as we see from DPP program, a community and your sort of personal experience are very important in, in driving changes. And I think most of us have seen that what is Movember, or at least know that that's kind of related to Mustache. It is a um, movement that uh, raises awareness of women, uh, men health issue. So in three years total, and it has raised over $6 million. It was like 65. I, I almost want to believe that the numbers are higher because in, in November, I usually see some of my friends keeping their mustache. Um, many projects were funded. Um, I think what's beautiful about this is, you know, that sort of in very specific, but wide enough goals for people to participate. And not only that, I think women have some ways to participate too. Uh, and, and by participating in this, it gives a sense of belonging and community. Um, so we're looking at um, as a really great example of you know, driving changes through a community. The other changes, and I think we have seen it, even though we don't know that what that is for, we know that it's an ice bucket challenge for ALS. Um, and similarly, even more money was raised um, for um, this conditions um, for, um, for doing further researches. And the, 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 I think the prompts are quite simple. Um, it was also fun, it's a factor of fun. And it, um, it's very simple, you text three other friends to do the challenge and they have to do a challenge and they will, they, they are, they, and they will share in the social media. What's kind of word of referral, referral mouth, um, word of referral, uh, word of mouth kind of referral um, effect. And almost it can be done anywhere, anytime. Um, I've seen my friends doing that in cold winter time. So quite an interesting sort of um, driving changes through community moving, uh, building. And sort of we, we also look at um, and in, in making changes in healthcare, we need sort of new design thinking process. And in many startups that I've been involved in, we, we take this approach. We look at sort of problem solving, human centered approach um, to design changes for healthcare. Now generally we're gonna look at the different components when you I think one of the most um, important components and not often done in healthcare is a, a experience of an individual. Uh, we often design um, healthcare to optimize the internal processes, administrative processes, uh, but we often forget that human experience matter. And especially what, what we're trying to drive here in, in age and in early is to drive people to make changes in preventive care. So let me just maybe, we have a few examples here to share. Uh, in Mayo clinics, uh, where I think this make me just dial back, you know, every year about 3.6 million appointments were missed. Um, people just didn't show up. What happens when people don't show up in the medical appointment is that potential diagnosis would have been missed. Um, people were not getting the care that they want, uh, they needed. As a result is really poor outcome, higher cost. And especially in, um, in, in, in countries, in developed countries like Singapore and some other nations where healthcare costs are rising, um, it really creates burden in the healthcare systems. What many police have done in this location of police in Phoenix is that they, they, 
The two is kind of human centric approach. Look at low why. How do we? How can we remove the hurdles of people showing up an appointment? Um, the first example that they have done is really kind of redesign the. Keep in mind, this is about I think about at least twelve years ago, and that was done in Mayo Clinic. The space of the waiting area. Um, it, kind of looking at the sort of warm color, earthy tones and give people a sense of comfort and less anxiety, less sterile environment when people actually step into a um, medical facility. Uh, the other kind of interesting experience that I did was they call this a Jack and Jill rooms. And traditionally, and even today, most of the places I've seen is that in a doctor consultation room, you have the exam bed and a consultation area in one room. So what they have realized is that in an exam bag, uh, there's a lot of anxiety that's been, um, because your under many instruments are there, a lot of un, un, um, unfamiliar tools are being used on you. And um, when you are, when the doctor wants to discuss the conditions and having a consultation with you, it, um, it's not conducive. So what I did is to separate the room, the consultation room, to a different area. Um, there's actually a separate door that allows them to enter through that. Now, not only that you can actually have some comfort in discussing um, your conditions, uh, your needs with the doctor, but it also allows you to invite your family members, uh, which is really important in um, the, the experience of um, the, the patients. So that is one sort of interesting um, design they have put in place in the clinics. Lastly, this might look really sort of archaic, but uh, some many years ago, and they understood that people do not like to wait. And waiting time was um, one of the impediment that people do not want to show up in a medical appointment. So a, key, a checking kiosk, as uh, checking kiosk was put in place to help people sort of facilitate the checking process and reduce the waiting time. And now like it, it seems really common and you, you step into most of the um, hospital and medical facilities, you would see that um, checking kiosk. Um, at the time was quite new. Um, it was implemented in Mayo clinics. If we kind of fast forward a little bit, um, a quite recent example is a, a space, a, a, a company called Health Quarters. It, it is in downtown Manhattan. And what have they done is a collaboration with um, Health Quarters and Mount Sinai, a very well-known, renowned hospitals. Their yeah, pictures actually, the, the, the value proposition is quite, quite, quite unique and simple and great because we want to bring health access to you, right? I want to address your everyday health need. And often we'll run around to go to a dental, a vision, go to my primary care, my GPs, and people also believe in acupuncture. So they kind of put everything under uh, one roof. Um, and these are all led by doctors and um, led by Malthonic doctors, um, designed together with these, what we call um, ally health professionals. And the rest of your different needs here. Uh, so if you step inside, it really, you can hardly tell that you're actually in a sort of healthcare medical facilities. The design took a lot of inspiration that's gonna help retail um, space designers. Um, it's very open, it's very comfortable. It also has areas where people can work, um, check your emails, have a cup of coffee. So really sort of take away that sort of, you know, sterile, um, long wait time. Even when you wait, it doesn't feel like you're waiting in that environment. So one of the components that they have, it's quite interesting as well. They do not, um, aside from the clinical operators, the nurses and doctors they have, they have what they call the care lead. Essentially, sort of your health managers, your community managers, 
your um, the person that um, will help you feel comfortable, engage with you, help you to understand um, you, and enhance your experience. It's kind of like the the close thing that you. It's like a concierge or like the geniuses in the Apple Store. So it took away a sort of um, very sterile, um, also very formal relationship that you have, and makes people actually want to come to um, get the necessary um, treatments and diagnosis that they need. Now, we, the sort of last part of what we would like to kind of touch upon is looking at how technology um, plays a role in how we um, transform healthcare. Uh, in the last two years, I think COVID has changed, I think, majorly two things. Is one, our as we are very used to right now, we are we do not have to see our physician uh, in order to receive care in person. Um, telemedicine is now widely accepted. Uh, and um, sort of the one is kind of propels the people like openness and to accepting technology and understanding technology. And number two, people are more through many different surveys, people are now more aware and taking more action and taking care of their long-term health. So this, this two, these two um, sort of trends um, really sort of come in, in handy how we kind of address like our health, how we want to like looking at into preventive care. So I take for an example of looking at sort of the more kind of homegrown or what we're doing locally and what we're doing in, in our company uh, with our partners. Um, gastric cancer is the number six killers in Singapore of cancer. And uh, it's, often it's often in Singapore compared to other developed nations uh, are usually diagnosed on a later stage. And what that means is that your mortality, your survival rate is really low when you're looking at stage three and stage four um, detection. Now, um, traditionally, a, what we look at, how do we detect gastric cancer? Um, it's recommended for male and female over 40 years old. And we have to go through a pretty uh, non-pleasant invasive procedure called gastroscopy. Literally just running down the tube through your throat, your esophagus, down to your stomach. Uh, definitely not a pleasant experience. And most people do not enjoy and do not want to go for that. As a result, the diagnosis is low. And when people are, when the gastric cancer is detected, it's usually sort of late or too late. Now, um, as one of our partners, Marex is a homegrown microRNA company, biotech startup. They have a microRNA not messenger RNA, so microRNA biomarker-based detection through blood. And it's the first, it's the world's first molecular blood test to detect gastric cancer earlier. So when we look at technology like this, right, so we want to move the curve from, again, sick care to healthcare. Having a blood test, um, having blood drawn as compared to running a tube down your, your um, esophagus is obviously less intense, uh, less invasive. And what it means also, having blood tests can be drawn, blood can be drawn in many different places. It widens, it doesn't replace gastroscopy, don't get me wrong, but if what we do in sort of looking at early detection and preventive care is to look beyond, look um, beyond sort of sick care, sort of invasive um, procedure, looking at blood test and how can we use the blood test if it's if a, if a tube of blood can help you to detect cancer gastric cancer early and more people can be detected and more people can be then found through doing the right procedures um, this will help us to achieve our goals of early detection um, another interesting technology so with our partner um, from GE Healthcare is a 
um, ultrasound device um, that is designed for detecting breast cancer, the 3 d ultrasound. We know that uh, for most women, at least, that mammogram experience, taking a mammogram exam is never a pleasant experience. Generally, quadrosaurus induces a lot of anxiety, and it can be quite, pre quite painful when your breast is impressed. Now, um, this does not obviously replace a uh, mammogram. What it is, is it's an interesting existing technology we use ultrasound, but redesigned to help detect um, breast cancer for women in all ages. Today, mammogram is designed for women that are over 40 years old and above, and mammogram has radiation, right? It's, so it, we would not, and, and World Health Organization in Korea and Malaysia does not recommend that to be used on every woman. But we do know that breast cancer happens for younger women as well. So what um, well, we are um, partnering with G Healthcare in our, our medical center is introduce this um, device. And it's really fast is a, if you look at sort of the, the pro um, transducer design is a cuff design designed for women. It only takes about three steps to take three views of your breast, both sides, and generally be done within minutes. And doesn't have that sort of discomfort that you get from mammogram. And we also understand it. Um, this is especially good for Asian women because Asian women have dense breasts and there's a lot of misdiagnosis. There are higher misdiagnosed um, uh, dense breast women under mammogram. Um, so this is one example that we think that the technology can help for early detection of diseases. Now, this, this is a point of care testing device. Again, it's not new. It's been around for, for years. Sort of um, generally a desktop devices that allows you to do blood tests on the spot. Uh, it's generally finger prick, it requires a few drops of blood. It gives you a measurement within minutes of your general health, metabolic conditions, your diabetes, your HBU, A1C, your glue, your cholesterol, your liver function, your kidney function, even your full blood count. So we also are introducing these technologies um, because not only that it sort of you know fast turnaround time, but it is really a great tool to actually engage people in their health. If you can see your blood test result on the spot, it allows us to engage um, you to be more interested in your health, to discuss changes and um, treatments that we can provide for you. So this is um, in general called point of care testing device. And today, here I also want to kind of point out an interesting collaboration that we have with SCTD um, um, Prof. Ishiel and his team. We are working together to introduce what uh, Prof. Ishiel has called a socially interactive robotic flower. In our setting, a preventive care center, uh, one of the procedures that, that sort of deter people from going is blood drawing. It can be a really scary experience. Um, so by introducing a social interactive, I would call this sort of soothing um, tool to distract when blood is drawn um, is our sort of kind of experiment that we're doing with uh, SDTD. So what it does is, let me see again. I'm not able to, um, so it, um, the video doesn't, um, I think I have a little bit of issue here. It sort of mimics the, the nature movement of flowers that so creates a talking point and soothing so factor for when your blood is drawn, uh, hopefully as a distracting factor so, and enhance your experience along the way. Back to that. Um, so one of the, some of the things that we are we are working on today is um, redesign customer gowns, uh, patient gowns, as you say that. 
Um, I think many of us have the experience of um, being asked to put on this really flimsy, thin, um, overly exposed uh, patient gown. We're going through different exams. So our designers are, so have been working on this sort of gown concept of being able to modestly making sure the material is great for full coverage, um, but also comfortable. And also design a way that, that so that you're not required to take off, for example, for a breast exam. Take off the whole gown and expose itself unnecessary, but have the flaps come to come down and only um, to um, um, expose the body necessarily to perform some exams, especially I think in this case is breast exams. Um, so that's one of the exams that we're doing in our center. And one thing that I, I thought was quite, quite exciting in the space is in genome um, space and genomic space. And the first human genome project uh, started in 1990. It took 13 years to sequence one human genome, whole genomes. Uh, many, many countries, uh, 13 years, $1 billion um, to do that. Today, to, to sequence whole genome for one person, takes only about a day or two, um, costs generally even $3,000 or less. Uh, tremendous sort of improvement in technologies. And, and Singapore has taken up the initiative and it was announced in straight time, and you'll see, to sequence 100,000 healthy individuals. Uh, consists of different sort of racial diversity. But the purpose is that to, to, to understand what causes cancers and other diseases. And what, this is significant because most of the sort of human genome or genome projects in the world are covering Western Caucasian sort of population. In Singapore, by, by, by looking at this 100,000 population, we're covering about 80% of the Asia diversity. So I'm actually super excited about kind of see how um, this population genomic studies will kick off and help us better understand um, diseases and how we can then intervene on that. Um, so like to, 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 to kind of summarize, like uh, we, 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 we love all the examples of this study. We know that to improve, uh, to motivate someone to come and to preventive care action, we, we look at sort of maybe two basic principles. We look at high tech and high touch. Using the right technology to support us, high touch and giving the right experience and environment so that um, people are willing to participate um, with us. Um, this is our center, um, a science park. And I would invite you all to come and visit um, next month. Now, um, to close, I, 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 I look at this um, entrepreneurial physician, in, in physician entrepreneur called um, Dr. Tom Lee from uh, one of the companies that he founded, what's called One Medical. He said, you have these high touch experiences in industries outside of healthcare and hospitality in, in restaurants. But more often than not, you have in healthcare, where you imagine humanity and high charge and good experience should be just as critical. But what we experienced was just the exact opposite. Um, so here in early and our company and what our, sort of our mission is to kind of take this inspiration and hopefully improve um, our care from sick care to healthcare. I think that's uh, kind of what I have for today. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Ms. Chu. Very exciting. Lots of nice examples. Uh, I like the fact that you are also trained as an engineer, are you? I, I am trained as an engineer. Always helpful to uh, <laughs> first principle problem solving skills. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I like the fact that you mentioned about design thinking, human centric and all these things that we, we teach our students. I also like the many examples you gave. Um, ultrasound test, blood test for gastric cancer, and so on and so forth. I like especially the robotic flower. 
uh, that, that would be really useful for my wife. She's always afraid of going for healthcare screening, you know, so, so <laughs> health screening yeah, once okay. a year. She's I like, can understand she's totally, yeah. <laughs> I, I have one question for you um, in view of the time. I, there are quite a lot of uh, colleagues and students in SUTD who are very keen uh, to take some of their deep tech uh, the work that they've done uh, to to spin off and things like that. And given your experience in this space uh, across uh, quite a, a lot of areas like medtech, diagnostic, digital health, uh, I understand that usually for medtech, it, it takes a long time because of the fact that it's mainly invasive. So, so what advice would you have uh, for us in this area of healthcare uh, entrepreneurship? It's, it's, it's quite interesting. You, you pointed it out quite frankly, Pak Chua. The medtech is generally, if you look at to the class two, three, and four, right, it's really, class one is relatively simpler when you look at the classification of the medical devices. Um, is, it's fortunately in Singapore, I think it's really fortunate we're in Singapore that you have a lot of different support and that allows like entrepreneurs or inspiring entrepreneurs, or physicians, or scientists, engineers to take their um, innovation to the next steps. One of the one of the sort of activities that I participated uh, is in, I think SUTD. I also mentor a couple of teams from SUTD. Uh, it's called Lean Launchpad. It's one of the tools that yeah. yeah so you take that sort of kind of validate. Let, let's kind of validate your this um, your your problem statement. It's kind of this ten week program. You can. Um, it, it, you can participate to validate and get a lot of different experience advices from different mentors. And Enterprise Singapore has a lot of different grants right now to support. But I think one of the, the, the things that I, I, I learned as an entrepreneur through my own mistakes as well is as an engineer, as pitfalls or like scientists, we also are, um, we build the hammers before finding the nails. <laughs> That's the one best way to do for that, right? So like, having this sort of outside view, like having a mentor, participating in some of this program, it's good, give us a sort of reality check in the market. It's not really yeah. the market is willing to pay for, and we too often fall in love with our own ideas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm learning a lot through the Lean Launchpad as well. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Miss.